If you followed the 2016 presidential election, you've probably seen this map. This map shows the states that Hillary Clinton won in blue and the states that Donald Trump won in red. And if you followed the election particularly closely, you've probably seen this map. Now this map shows the same data, but at the county level. And as you can see, many of the blue counties are clustered around big cities, and many of the red counties are spread across rural America. Now these maps have been used to support the now widely accepted idea that rural communities are synonymous with two things, whiteness and redness, where whiteness refers to the color of their skin and redness to their politics. But it isn't necessarily the case that rural communities are all white or all red, and this narrative that's been perpetuated by both the left and the right obscures a deeper truth. Rural communities are more diverse than we realize, and our failure to recognize the diversity of experiences and beliefs within them is widening the urban-rural divide. Our commission of what I'll call rural homogenization, that is, ignoring that rural diversity, is exacerbating and expanding the disconnect and the lack of understanding that these two groups have for one another. Now, I grew up in Thompsonville, a rural community located in northern Michigan. With more than a little luck, I received a scholarship to obtain my bachelor's degree at Yale. And as a first-generation college student coming from the rural Midwest, I met a kind of person at Yale that I had never met before. They thought that all country music sounded the same. Growing up, and particularly in my later years of high school, um, I loved riding around in my 95 Ford Ranger pickup, uh, listening to Luke Bryan on the speakers while I was driving down an empty back road. My peers in college also thought that the silence of night, the kind that you only get when you're out in the middle of the woods, away from the city sounds, was eerie. And as a child, and even to this day, I loved taking late night or early morning walks with my mom, hearing nothing but a cacophony of crickets and spring peepers in the background. But our differences didn't end there. Now, I love where I grew up. I think northern Michigan is the most beautiful place in the country. But during my junior year of Yale, I, I desperately wanted one of my friends to come and visit me in my hometown. He grew up in the suburbs of Boston and had never visited northern Michigan before. I said, you'll love it. But he was being very hesitant about organizing a trip and finally revealed the reason for his hesitation to me. I just think small towns breed hate, he said. Your people are just so provincial. Now that word, provincial, it dripped with disdain in the way that he said it. And for the first time in my life, it made me feel a tinge of shame for where I came from. And this wasn't the first or the last time that I would be taunted for growing up in rural America during my time in college, but it was the most direct and the most illuminating. The current conversation hammers home this idea that rural communities are backward, self-interested, and resistant to change and progress. It asserts that the oppression of liberalism comes not from politicians and campaigns that disenfranchise rural voters, but instead from the so-called provincial people themselves. As long as we keep having this conversation in this capacity, we'll only grow more polarized as a nation. And the truth, it turns out, is that America looks less like this and more like this. This map shows what the United States would look like if all of the red votes and all of the blue votes were overlaid onto one another. So the more purple an area is, the more ideologically diverse it is. That is, the more equal the number of red and blue votes in that community. And as you can see from looking at this, many of America's rural communities are not all red or all blue, but purple. Now let's zoom in on one of those purple communities. This is Benzie County, the county that I grew up in. Now, the US government has a system of ranking counties according to how rural or how urban they are called the Rural Urban Continuum, or the RUC. A one on the RUC is the most urban a county can be, and a nine is the most rural a county can be. Benzie County is a nine on the RUC. And in addition to being very rural, Benzie County is 95% white. Only 25% of its residents hold college degrees, as opposed to 35% in the nation as a whole and many of its residents fall below the national median household income. So when we look at the county level map, 
we're not necessarily surprised, if we take the media's portrayal of rural communities to be true, that it looks deeply red. But here's what the voter data actually shows us for Benzie County. Now, as you can see, this is for 2016. And as you can see, in 2016, while there were a significant number of red votes, there were also a significant number of blue votes. So when we talk about rural communities as though they're ideologically homogenous, we're missing a whole piece of the conversation. We're erasing this whole subsection of rural voters. And this distinction between popular culture's characterization of rural communities and the reality of rural diversity becomes even more stark when we look at two additional groups, people of color who live in rural communities and white people who live in rural progressive states. Examining the 2016 voter data can help to elucidate those distinctions. Now this is Greene County, Alabama. Greene County is an eight on the RUC, so again, very rural, and 81% of its residents are black. And in 2016, 82% of the vote in Greene County went to Hillary Clinton, despite it being an extremely rural county, among the most rural in America. And what we're seeing here may not surprise you, given the high rate at which black voters tend to choose Democratic candidates. But what it does reveal is that our discussions about who gets to claim rural, what rural's colors are, what rural looks like, privileges a certain narrative, and one that is not inclusive of everyone living in rural America. And we see these results replicated in other counties as well. So here we have Todd County, South Dakota, which is entirely encompassed within the Rosebud Indian Reservation. Now, Todd County is a nine on the RUC, and 88% of its residents identify as native. And in 2016, 71% of the vote in Todd County went to Hillary Clinton. But you never see people from Todd County in stories about rural America. And in fact, you never see native communities being profiled in these stories at all, despite the fact that many, rural many reservations are among the most remote and rural places in our country. Now, at this point, you might argue that that's because rural America is overwhelmingly white, and these are you know, one-off instances um, of counties where there are more people of color than white people. But the truth is, the one in four people living in a rural community identifies as a person of color. And when we look at the country as a whole, where just over one in three people identify as people of color, we can see the significance of that number. And now you might argue that that's because we're interested in rural white people and their voting patterns to begin with. And everyone knows that people of color would still choose Democratic candidates, regardless of whether they're living in rural or urban communities. But even rural white communities are not as homogenous as our current conversation portrays them to be. So let's have a look at Lamoille County, Vermont. Now, Lamoille County is an eight on the RUC, again, very rural, and 96% of its residents are white. But in 2016, Hillary Clinton won Lamoille County by 31 percentage points over Donald Trump. And when we look at the, rep at the results from 2012 and 2008, we see an even greater distinction between the vote for the Democratic candidate and for the Republican candidate, up to 50% discrepancy in those votes. And so what this shows us is that even rural white communities aren't inherently conforming to some voting patterns, customs, and ideologies that are laid out for us. And the choice to portray and to study only a small sector of rural communities is a deliberate decision, and not one that is inherent to the study and understanding of rural politics. Rural diversity in both race and ethnicity, as well as ideology, is alive and well in America. And rural homogenization is not just a semantic issue, but one that has real practical implications for national unity and cohesion. When we commit rural homogenization, we're more likely to bring to our conversations assumptions about our peers and, and colleagues who come from rural communities that they're backward and hillbillies who don't deserve our attention or who worse, require our re-education we're less likely to believe that we can find common ground. And we're more likely to carry out our distaste for these groups in insidious ways. And importantly, we're less likely to consider intersectionality in the search for solutions to rural problems, like rebuilding critical infrastructure and expanding access to medical and legal resources. 
And when I told one of my friends that I would be giving a talk about the politics of rural communities, he said, oh, so basically, hillbilly elegy. And for those who aren't familiar with it, Hillbilly Elegy is a popular memoir published in 2016 about life in rural Ohio. And while it does touch on some important issues facing rural America, it also plays directly into this narrative that rural communities have a singular identity. And I think that my friend's comments demonstrate that even the most well-read and educated among us often fail to see rural America as anything but a red and blue issue, when really it's so much more. When groups are left out of the conversation, they rightly resent those who have excluded them. And in the context of rural politics, this means that rural communities will continue to harbor resentment towards urban communities, who are often seen as the paternalistic and righteous decision makers over matters of national importance. A 2017 poll by the Washington Post revealed that 70% of Americans think that our country is today more divided than it was during the Vietnam War. And much of that divide exists along urban-rural lines. And we, today, in this moment, have the power to change that. Ultimately, it isn't the president who will divide or unite the country, regardless of who she or he may be. It's us, every one of us in this room, and every person you meet on the street. We can stop rural homogenization and start developing a nuanced understanding of our country's rural landscape when we stop homogenizing and whitewashing and boiling these communities down to worn out stereotypes that no longer represent them, and maybe never did. When we start understanding that even rural America is pluralistic, diverse, and complicated. The face of rural America is, in truth, the face of America. Not just white, but also brown and black, and not walls of red and blue, but blankets of purple. Thank you.